everyone, this is Tim here at InstaCluster. Welcome to another episode of InstaBlinks. Today we are joined by InstaCluster Chief Product Officer, Ben Slater. Ben, thanks for joining us. Hey Tim, nice to have a chat again. My first InstaBlinks for a while. Yeah, I know, man, it's been too long. Um, so today we are going to be talking about NoSQL databases, what they are and when to use them. So. Um, Ben, maybe if we can just crack straight into it, um, would you mind giving us a, a quick summary of, of what NoSQL means? Yeah, sure. I mean, NoSQL is a, an interesting term. Uh, a lot of people interpret it to mean it doesn't have SQL, uh, and that's that's generally true. Um, I've also seen it described as not only SQL because uh, you know some some NoSQL bases do at least have some kind of of SQL in them. Uh, but the way I like to describe it is. You know, basically, uh, it's a whole world of, of databases that were designed to uh, break limitations of, of SQL-based databases. Um, you know, before NoSQL came along, the world was just working with a generic definition of a database as a, a relational SQL database, and 99% you know, of the uh, use cases in the world were served by that. But it's a bit of a, a general tool to meet every possible requirement that happens to come along. Uh, and then, yeah, particularly with the dawn of the, the internet age and the kind of scale and always on requirements that you see coming through, uh, you know, and the amount of data that we see around, it started to become impossible to meet the requirements that were coming through there with, with that relational technology. Uh, and the NoSQL world really appeared in order to focus on a more narrow use case, yet be able to meet uh, those much more demanding requirements that were pushing uh, the relational world beyond beyond what could be met. And, and so, in terms of those those limitations, are we talking purely about scale here? In, in terms of the data volume pumping through the database, or are we are we are there other limitations that that NoSQL solves? Yeah, I mean, it, there can be a few, and it's in, and one of the big things that people need to be aware of when looking at NoSQL versus relational databases is that each family of NoSQL databases is about breaking a different set of limitations um, you know, by, by focusing on one particular kind of limitation, you can break that, but you, you might lo you know, lose that in other ways. So, uh, you know, the Hadoop sort of family and Hadoop was probably the first one that came along and that was really purely data volume. Hadoop mm -hmm. is not particularly great at, you know, large volumes of transactions. It's not an always on thing, but it is good at chugging through a massive data lake or massive pile, pile of data. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got your Cassandra type of databases, the, that sort of family of databases, which Apache Cassandra is an example that we're obviously very familiar with, which are designed to provide very high scale in terms of operations per second and amount of data stored and very high levels of reliability and availability, but, but do that at the expense of the flexibility of uh, how you can query the database and um, you know, the uh, amount of complex processing that you can embed within the database compared to um, a relational database. And then you've got something like Mongo in the NoSQL world, which is really about flexibility of development. Uh, you know, the, the, the limitation that they set to break was the uh, need to sort of define schemas up front and to, to be you know, married to a schema to have more flexibility in how you define your schema and how you're able to, to query that. So each family uh, is breaking a different limitation and, and it, you know, that is the whole point of NoSQL is that by focusing on a, a more narrow set, you can do more in that space rather than trying to make it meet every, every possible uh, area at once. That's really interesting. So if we just narrow in on one of those technologies, let's just say, Apache Cassandra, because that's what we, you know, InstaClass is very familiar with. What is it about the structure of Cassandra that allows for that high level of, of scalability and reliability? The first thing it, it starts off with is it's a distributed database, you know, a relational database. Typically, when you want to scale a relational database, you, you just have to keep make, putting it on a bigger server. And, and you know, certainly back when Cassandra was first started, the technologies for horizontal scaling were, were kind of uh, non-existent for relational database and you just keep buying a bigger and bigger server and eventually, and they get more and more expensive, not just linearly more expensive, but exponentially more expensive as they get <laughs> they get bigger yeah. uh, and, and you still get to a point where they can't, can't get any bigger. Whereas the approach that Cassandra takes is the, the more modern horizontal scaling where you're using commodity hardware and having your database spread over multiple servers and Cassandra is taking care of all that all of that for you of spreading your data out over the servers through um, partitioning and those kind of things. Whereas mm -hmm. to try and spread your database over 
uh, multiple relational servers, typically you have to be dealing with that in your application about how you're going to put the, the data on different servers and where it's going to live. Okay. So, so Cassandra sort of natively built with the idea of availability in mind. So it's, it's natively spreads across multiple servers without any manual need for sort of intervention sharding in those more manual processes behind yeah it. exactly and also because it's over multiple servers it's storing redundant copies of the data and it mm. happily co happily copes with one server failing or multiple servers you know, you know, failing without any interruption to server so it's based on using commodity hardware that does does fail and again the, the modern sort of architectural approach whereas relational databases much more rely on you having a very highly available hardware platform underneath with um, you know things like redundancy in the disks and all of those um, uh, types of things, which again, gets can get quite expensive. Okay. And, and so so when we, I guess, extrapolate that out to, to use cases, obviously relational databases are, are still the, the most common, commonly used database behind most, you know, big applications. So, so where do you see um, when someone's assessing, you know, NoSQL and SQL, how would you recommend uh, matching different relational versus NoSQL workloads within a, you know, within someone's stack? How how do you choose to go relational versus NoSQL? The first thing that I usually say is that there probably has to be something worrying you about whether it's going to work in your relational database mm. before you before you go to your NoSQL database. If if you're comfortable that your problem is small enough that it fits. You know, I mean, it's and it's in a sort of standard relational database, and it isn't expected to to scale beyond that uh, anytime soon. Um, then, yeah, relational databases are a very well known commodity. You have lots of tools to support them. Uh, are fairly flexible in how you, you use them, or all of those kind of things. But mm. as soon as you start get to a point where you're worried, oh, is that really going to work or am I going to spend all my time tuning indexes and um, uh, doing strange hacks to, to keep it working? That's when you probably should think about, well, is a, is a NoSQL database going to be a better better fit for, for this requirement and possibly just this part of my requirement? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's very common to see people mixing in a single application a relational database and a, and a NoSQL database. We have even that part of our architecture at InstaCluster in our management platform. We have mm. a, a Postgres database that's at the, the core that does a lot of it. And then we use Cassandra for our, our high volume uh, monitoring uh, yeah. data, um, which you know wouldn't fit in Postgres. So that, that is a perfectly uh, normal thing to do and, and a, a you know, really good way of looking at it. If you've got some particular part of your application that's very high volume data and high volumes of transactions, then, then that's a good place to look at those alternative uh, NoSQL technologies. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. So it's often just around aligning the right tool for the right use case, right? Not saying that one is better than the, than the other, but there's there's different use cases that, you know, Cassandra is better aligned to, and there's there's some that, you know, Postgres and other relational databases are, are just naturally better served. To, to uh, absolutely. And, and, you know, I've actually given a, a lecture at the local uni about no, no SQL databases. And I always say, you know, if, if you take one thing away, it's that, you know, you have to choose the right NoSQL for your for your job. It's like you know, relational databases; they're, they're kind of easy because of, you've got, unless you've got a massive problem, it's they're all pretty much the same. There's differences around the edges, but that's it. But there is no point in going to a NoSQL database unless you choose the right NoSQL database for your use case. It's probably going to be mm -hmm. worse um, if you choose the wrong one for your use case. Got it. And so and that, that's probably a, a good segue. So I mean, I mean InstaCluster do a lot of work with organizations that are wanting to, to modernize their, their data infrastructure and, and leverage you know, technologies like Cassandra to lower the, the cost of ownership and get better scalability and, and stability of their, their platforms. So when, we're, when an organization is looking to say migrate off um, SQL technology and, and start leveraging more NoSQL, what are, I guess, some of the the biggest considerations you would you would point out with those with those sorts of, of migrations and, and transitions? Yeah, first of all, there's a, there's a sort of skills consideration. You do have, need to know how to use these no no SQL databases. So making sure that either within your organisation or getting some help about someone to, to choose the right no SQL database to start with, as we as we just talked about, and then sort of work out you know, high level how you're going to to use that uh, mm. is definitely a, a you know, really good place to start. Yeah, on the technical migration, uh, it's not going to be a no-code 
you know, just to pull, swap it out without any code change. Uh, that is going to require quite a bit of planning about how you're going to change your code and make sure you use it properly. So, so working through uh, all of that is is certainly important. And then, you know, as we were saying, th thinking about how you operate it. Uh, at the other end as well, you've got this new technology that you need to need to operate, uh, and working out how you're going to how you're going to do that. Don't don't forget that uh, yeah, as part of your early planning. Well, Ben, thanks so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to to get your insight again, and um, yeah, hope to to get you back very shortly. Thanks, Tim. Great chat. Thanks very much. Bye, guys.